All right, so we talked about this a little bit before, but what is a program? So again, program is a series of instructions. So just like if I were to give you instructions on how to build a house, you're giving somebody instructions. So first you say you lay the foundation, right? You pour the concrete, all that. So you get the structure of the foundation. Then you do framing and then you do drywall and then you do painting, right? You, you tell them a series of instructions. So you're building from the ground up. First, do this, then do this, then do this. And you give them specific exact instructions. If somebody hasn't built a house before, you gotta tell them exactly what to do. You just give them an order of operations. Okay, first foundation, second framing, so on. So that's the idea with program is it does not know any, it doesn't have any human context. So you're just giving it a series of instructions to perform whatever operations you want. Um, and just as if you were talking to somebody who only knew French, you'd have to give them instructions in French. Um, similar to human languages, there are programming languages that vary in terms of the syntax, in terms of like similar to, to human language, we have nouns and verbs. They have different nouns that are equivalent to ours in different languages. So you can translate effectively human speech to, to computer speech. So in the end, really what we're doing when we're making a program is we are going from the way we think in instructions to the way the programming programming language language to computer code or the computer language so what we're trying to understand in this class is really this part this step right here is going to be handled mostly by things that people have already made for us so we we won't be translating the programming language to the computer language. We'll, we'll want to understand that a little bit so that we can write a good program. But what we're going to be dealing with is handling this step from human language, how we think about steps into programming language. So how do we tell the computer to think in the steps? Because um, realistically, we can, like I said, we can think of this as the end step uh, primarily for this class, because we are not going to do this step right here. So that's a program. Programming languages. So what are some examples? Add this here. So we've got low, low level to high level languages. So when I say low level, this means uh, it's closer to machine code. So meaning in the in our little diagram here for high level it's closer to how we think i and then over here the computer language is low so we have all sorts of variants in between here but high is just closer to the way the human thinks uh, more abstracted from the computer language effectively, um, whereas low is closer to that computer language. It's it's more directly what the computer wants to interpret in, in its understanding of things. So uh, if we look at low level to high level, basically low level are things like machine code, assembly, uh, programming language. High level starts at like C, goes up C++, goes up to like Python, MATLAB, C Sharp, Java, Julia. Uh, these are high level, very abstracted languages that make it quite close to our understanding of languages, of, of explaining how to perform operations to a computer. Um, whereas machine code is very close to how it wants to manage things. So low level languages, Again, like the assembly that we looked at before. How do they work? Well, they're basic instructions. <clears throat> Once again, very close to machine design. 
So this is something that will de be dependent on the machine. So if you've heard of x86 and 32-bit, so these are specific operating systems that are built on different paradigms. And you don't need to like know the specifics of how this works, but basically there's, there's different hardware that we can write software for. And with low level languages, you have to write very specifically for the hardware. And typically with a low level language, you may have to have different types of assembly languages for different sets of hardware. Uh, so you may go to one computer, use one assembly language and go to another computer, you have to use a completely new assembly language. Um, but as for how they're functioning, they're very low level. So they're things like move a, a number into a variable. So you got your variable here and you move some value into it. Maybe you also want to add. So you add two to your variable. Maybe you also want to increment. So move the variable up by one and then go to one. Maybe you want to start back at line one once you get to this point. So you do a loop of sorts, you just cycle back. Those are some examples of lower level operations in programming. So what about high level languages? The way they work, again, is high level instructions. So it's similar to if, if we were giving instructions to somebody, we're not gonna say move into the variable, the value 10. I just wanna say like uh, A is 11, right? That's a much simpler, more human way of communicating that. So with high level languages, you have high level instructions, very abstracted from the machine design. So they're a lot closer to how we're thinking. So what the machine does with high level languages is it takes a high level human code, compiles it to machine code, or uh, it can do multiple steps. It can do something like the high level human code down to the low level code, down to uh, the interpreted that that takes that lower level code and then runs it in the machine. But with high level languages, one of the advantages is an independence of machines. So typically with high level languages, you will need to use different languages for different machines. So for example, uh, we'll all use MATLAB. That's a high level language, whether you have a uh, PC, 32-bit PC, x86, uh, or 64-bit PC. If you have a Macintosh, if you have any sort of Apple thing, if you have Android, you can run Python. If you have Linux, you can run Python. So, so for high-level languages, it's much simpler to translate machine by machine. And realistically, what that means is that it has just been constructed, the compiler or the uh, interpreter, the thing that translates the high level machine code into the code that the machine actually understands that has been made for multiple operating systems. So if there were a new computer that didn't have a Python interpreter on it, in order to run Python, you would need to create an interpreter for that hardware. So basically it's just been, uh, with the high level language, all that work has been saved because the interpreter or the compiler has probably already been made for your specific machine. Okay, so we'll, we'll be using high level. Uh, the lowest in this class we'll get is C, so you won't be doing like assembly. And the reason is the advantages and disadvantages. So with low level programming languages, the advantages are they're faster running and you have greater control over the hardware. So typically you'd use something like assembly if you really had to do more basic operations but needed it to be extremely fast. And realistically even nowadays you wouldn't even go down to assembly, you typically do something like C, which we will get to later. But the low level again, faster running because you get to tell it exactly how to do what you're doing. Um, if it's higher level, you use an interpreter or compiler to translate the high level code to the low level, which nowadays is actually pretty efficient. So a lot of times you don't need to go to the low level uh, to make it plenty efficient for your system. And a lot of times with high level languages, people have written low level code 
so that high level can get access to the uh, to what we care about in the hardware uh, for the greater control we're caring about. So the advantages of a high level, on the other hand, are that it's faster for us to write code. It's much uh, it's much more intuitive. Uh, just going from the human way of thinking to high level code, as well as typically being a lot less, you have to type to perform whatever operation you're trying to do. And usually, like I say, with high level, it's it's fast enough for us. If we're an engineer and we're just trying to basically have a calculator that runs numbers for us, uh, typically it doesn't matter if it takes a second. Whereas if you're creating a game engine and it has to perform thousands of operations a second and has to check that, for example, let's, let's look at an example of this. Okay, so for example, with the game engine, you may have a couple characters. You want to make sure one, you're, you're running a physics engine, so you want to make sure, one, they don't fall through the ground. So you're going to check that, you know, however many times a second. Let's say you check that 100 times a second. Um, so basically you have gravity acting on these characters to pull them down. And every uh, or a thousand times a second you want to check okay is this is this character suspended in the air are they right on the platform surface or are they through uh, and in the case that they're through you just move them up so that's very basic physics engine right so you may have to perform that thousands of times a second so it's very important that you have fast running code so you wouldn't want to use something like python for example necessarily it's possible nowadays there are workarounds but typically and historically low level you you'd go to c to do a game engine for example rather than python so yeah that's the idea there um whereas we are we're just doing stuff like often we want to perform physics operations so let's say we have the tried and true physics problem. You have a cannonball launched at 100 meters per second out of a cannon at 60 degrees. And we just want to perform this operation. If it takes a second, we don't really care. Um, what we want to be able to do is write it fast and not have to worry about constructing a complicated low level program. We just want to hurry and write the code and it'll run fast enough for us. Typically, it's like a thousandth of a second, and that's plenty for a lot of the stuff we would do in engineering problems. Let's go into some basic overall conceptions within programming. It narrows down to variables. Variables are what you're storing information in, um, in general. So variables are things that hold value. They're like, you wanna store a number, that's a variable. You want to store a sentence, that's a variable. You want to store just like a single character, like A, that's a variable. You want to store like some information, if it's true or false, those are all variables, right? Um, and the way we can work with the variables is having different data types. And we'll go more into this later, but the idea is you have different types of data, like in math, we have symbols, right? That would be one type of data. We have numbers. If you just think back to like basic algebra, right? There's integers, which are one set of numbers. There's whole numbers. There's all sorts of sets of numbers in there. So in programming, we just have a bunch of variable types, data types like that. Uh, in addition to variables, we also have functions. So functions are when you have a input and some output. So like in general, what a program does is it takes some inputs and then the program gets those and it outputs some outputs, right? But sometimes within a program, we want to perform an operation a bunch of times. So let's say we needed to take uh, multiply by something by two a lot of times. So we wanted an input and we want to return input multiplied by 
2. Okay, so this is a very basic function. Um, our output is just 2 times our input. So if we wanted to do that a bunch of times, we could use a function to accomplish that. For loops, loops are if you want to circle back. So like we mentioned in this low level, uh, we had the example of go to 1. So we circled back and just performed the same operations again and again, right? This is uh, effectively what a loop does, is it goes through and performs operation multiple times. And there are typically two types of loops, for and while. Uh, we'll go more into those later. But the that's uh, one aspect of programming, is loops. Then there's also conditional statements. So conditional statements are like what you would think of like an ultimatum, right? Just think about it typically how we normally think about it. So if I wanted to do something if the sky was blue, then I would use a conditional statement. If sky is blue, then do something. Um, else if is, if the sky isn't blue, if the first condition is false, then we check another condition. Uh, else if sky is red, then do something else. And then else is, if all those conditions above you were checking against are false, then you go ahead and move on and do the else response. Um, so these are what you're going to typically need to know uh, in all programming languages. So we'll first learn how to do all these in MATLAB, kind of get you familiar with the process. And then later we'll step into C, sort of have to deal with it in a lower level um, language to do more complicated stuff, or not more complicated, but do it in a more complicated manner often to MATLAB. Okay, and we went over this before, but just to reiterate, the different dynamics you have in programming, you have standards typed. Uh, so something like this, you just write in lines of code. So this is what, when you see on a movie, uh, typically they do this really poorly, but if you see in a movie them creating a program, they're typically just like lines upon lines of code. Right, that's this standard typed expressions. That's what you're probably seeing. Then there are diagrams, which are a flow process of variables and information in here, and you circle it around. This is an example of a MATLAB diagram that we won't super get into this class, but if you do more in MATLAB, you'll see these. Then there's ladder logic, which we mentioned, uh, which basically just goes rung by rung and performs a series of operations. And then there's blocks, which just start at the top. They're similar to rungs, but they're basically just one rung of ladder logic. Do this, then this, then this, then this, and so on. So uh, there are different operating systems. You probably recognize all these, but maybe you haven't heard of Linux, for example. Um, so there are different operating systems. The standard three are Linux-based, Windows, and Mac. Um, Mac being Apple, for those who don't know. So the way we're going to construct a program within our system is we're going to need a file editor, the compiler or the interpreter, and then we use that compiler or interpreter to run the executable or interpreted file. So if we look at file editors and different operating systems, we looked at these before, but with Windows, for example, uh, basic one is Notepad++. You can also use Vim. It's a little complicated for new users, but also the one we will primarily be using is a file editor that's integrated into the program GUI. Um, the GUI, again, being a graphical user interface. So integrated into the GUI, if we look at GUIs, here's an example of MATLAB you'll become very familiar with this. But basically right here, we have the text editor, and that's where you write your lines of code. The file editor, you, in a lot of languages and even across languages, there are a lot of different options for uh, GUIs 
that typically have integrated file editors. And we'll go more into the advantages of that later, but we'll, we'll primarily be dealing with this. You're welcome to use other stuff, but this is the recommended manner. And we'll show some of the reasons for that later. Let's now look at C. So C, this is MinGW, a developer studio. Um, and it's a GUI used to construct C programs, also C++ programs. This is a text editor, just like this was a text editor in MATLAB. Uh, and then next we've got within Python, there's this text editor with a shell, uh, and we'll go more into this later, but just as an overview, all of these are doing the same thing. They're just allowing you to write lines of code. They just each have their own advantages in, in, uh, showing you, you can see this different coloring and stuff, uh, gives you information about the syntax, how it fits into the language. Um, sometimes there's autocomplete. So similar to how on emails nowadays, they have the ability to like predict what you're going to type and let you automatically fill that in. Um, these GUIs have a lot of those advantages and sometimes they do other things. So that's the system, um, basically just how we are interfacing with programs. Now I won't go right into the C and Python. We'll do those later, but let's start into some MATLAB and just get introduced. We've, you've only been able to install MATLAB. If you haven't, there's an online option for you to use while you're figuring it out, try and pull it up and follow along. And, uh, we can get into starting using MATLAB. So I'm pulling up MATLAB now. We'll just start getting into the basics. All right. So here we are. Uh, this may or may not be exactly how your MATLAB looks. So, uh, there are a couple different setups that we have automatically. So let me show you if you've got all of these closed. So you just have this basic thing. What, how, how do you get all the stuff that, that is now hidden? So just in case you ever accidentally close something or maybe it's in your way, you want to close it, use it later. But if you see right here, if I click down on home, uh, it's not locked or pinned. So if I click away, that will go away. If you like that to stay, which I personally do, then you can click the pin there. So if you click the pin, that will lock that toolbar to be visible. And that will include all the tabs up here. So I recommend doing that. And uh, like a web browser, you can switch between the tabs. And this is effectively a toolbar like Microsoft Word, where you have different options within the different sections of this toolbar. So right here in home is where I'm going to get access to open up all of these again. So if I click down on layout, there's some defaults that I have the option to do. So default to column, just the command window and just the command window again. Um, so the, the difference here is if I click show current folder, show workspace, now I can see them on the side here. Uh, so the way you, the way you switch between layouts is using these default ones, or you can check the boxes up here to get, like for example, command history. So we want that docked, docked, meaning placed within this GUI held down, um, pop up like that. It's now off of the base GUI system. We have a lot of ability to reorganize this. So how these are tabbed right now, uh, because of the way I structured it of going into all but command window minimized and then opening them the way it automatically does it may be slightly different depending on your configuration of MATLAB, but it opens these tabs. So 
if I open workspace, let's say I want that to be in the bottom here, I'll drag this workspace and say I want it to fill the whole bottom, I just drag it to the bottom and the highlighted blue tells you where it will be. Let's say I want the current folder to be just on the left of the top one, I can move it there. Now, let's say I want it to fill the whole left. I just move it around, sometimes you have to fidget with it a little bit, but move it till it fills the whole left. And you can drag this in a bit. Uh, and it should show arrows, it's not because of the way I've set it up, but it'll probably show you arrows when you're able to drag this. So yeah, these are the different environments. Um, the way I like to have it is like this. If you just go back to default, that's how I like it. So we can see the main thing we got here is the command window. That's front and center. And why is that? Well, that's because that's primarily what we care about. That's the, the main interface we can use to just run lines of code. So if I say a equals one, this is a MATLAB code to write a variable a with the value one. So we'll go more into this, but just as your first line of code, you learn a equals one, click enter, it will run the single line of code and it will output the result saying a equals and one. So it's successfully updated the value of the variable a to be one. And if you look over here in your workspace, you'll see that we successfully made the variable a with value one. If I go back into the command window and do a equals two, now if I look at the workspace, a equals two is what happens. So this a equals one is now invalid. This is just a sequence of operations. So when I said a equals one up here, I overrid it here. Uh, so this is just because I did that in the past. This is not an up-to-date information. The workspace uh, contains the latest information. So that's the command window. Uh, allows you to create variables, that sort of stuff. Um, when, when you're new to MATLAB, one of the things I recommend is clicking on the getting started. Uh, that will pull up the MATLAB documentation for how to get started and some recommended tutorials. We're gonna use these as supplemental material to help cover everything. But I recommend if you're confused on something in MATLAB, just click get started with MATLAB. If it's matrices, if it's indexing arrays, if it's workspace variables, uh, just click that and it's got lots of information just going through this, how you create an array, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to know what these are yet, but just remember for the future, that is a great tool, uh, the MATLAB documentation to learn things. And just a refresher, like if you're doing a homework problem, you can't remember how to do something, uh, you can look up matrices and arrays, how to create new arrays. This is the command window, like we said. Uh, there's one more window you'll really want to know here. And that is, if you click this new script, it will add these to the toolbar and the, add these tabs, and it will pop up this right above your command window. And what is this? This is the editor we were talking about before. So this is where you can write in lines of code. And just as I ran lines of code right here in the command window, I can run a line of code equals, if I can type correctly, a equals one right here. And this is where there's really the advantage of using MATLAB is this editor provides a lot of tools to feed you information. Let's say you're trying to use the function plot. If I, if I just type, if I did it too fast, if I type plot, plot is a function you can use in MATLAB. We'll talk more about that later, but just to see some of the powers of this editor, if you do plot type open parentheses, it will automatically populate with a close parentheses. So it knows, okay, 
you want to open parentheses, it assumes you want to close parentheses. So just to save you some time. Um, then it gives you some information on the function plot typically has these inputs. Or this is how it defines it in the documentation, at least. So plot y, line space, or line spec, excuse me, and options. So this is a really powerful tool. Um, if I go back in here, I get to see that information. Also, right here, um, on the side of our editor, we have a warning signal right here and some lines just clarifying, OK, at line one, at a semicolon after the statement to hide the output. So if it's an orange, that means it's a warning. Uh, if there's an error with your code, like this would be an incorrect line, it'll be red. And it'll say, it'll have red and the exclamation mark for an error. And you can see if you hold over it, there is at line three, um, and it'll give you a little information. You won't know what this error is saying yet, but just as an overview, this is what the real advantage of this GUI is. And why do I mention that? Well, it's because last class, we created a file called test.m, right? And test.m had the following, a equals one, b equals one, and c equals a plus b, and then disp uh, c. So if I click run, I'll have to save this. So go to where you saved it last time. Where was my, there we go. And now save it as test2.m. So I'll save that and go ahead and click change folder. If you noticed it changed current folder to where that file is at, at present. Um, and now it will run the code and it will just go through and it will say a equals one. So test two right there, a equals one, b equals one, c equals two, like we expect. And disp will just display in the command window what c is. So our input to disp is c and it will just output to command window, whatever C is. So in this case, C is two, we'll output two, oops. We'll talk about that later. Um, but so this test 2.m, we just wrote this in just like we did in the file explorer before. So now we have test 2.m open. What if I double click this test.m right here? It will open the test.m that we created last time. So just like we wrote in the notepad or if you're on an upper, if you're on another operating system, whatever you wrote it in, uh, a equals one, b equals one, c equals a plus b and disp c. So when I open this, it's just as I saw it before. So now I'm able to click run this one and it will do, uh, it will do, if you type CLC in, it will clear the command window. So it's short for clear command window, the CLC. So just so you know, CLC, that just erases so that I can see just the output of this if I run it. So now I can go back. Now I'm running test. Test A equals one, B equals one, C equals two. So just as we were able to write this, in the MATLAB text editor, we were able to write this in Notepad last time, and now we can open it in MATLAB and run it. So you can write the code just like this, however you like. You could write it, you could pull up a Word document, write the code, copy it, paste it in here, and use it. Um, the reason we did Notepad is we didn't have MATLAB yet, so we can write down the code, start coding, and then once we have MATLAB, we can actually open it and run the code. So, but the, but the reason you want to use the GUI, though you don't have to, um, is 
get all this uh, extra information. Like you can just run right away. So you don't have to, let's say you accidentally forgot to type a plus. If I save that and I just kept, let's say I just kept running, writing a ton of code. C equals th uh, C plus 11 and C equals C plus 12. And now I just see again. Um, I would have to then, if I, if I had just run this in MATLAB first, it would have immediately popped up unrecognized function or variable. And because there's an error in this, um, it will pop up in the command window and explanation of the error. So it's an unrecognized function or variable, AB. So it doesn't know what AB is, right? Because we, we haven't defined it and it doesn't know what it is. So it's saying you got an error in test. This is the error. And then it's saying where you got the error, error in test line three. You can actually click that. And if I was in another file or whatever, if I click that, it will automatically pull me over to test line three so that I know where the error is. And then it tells me what's the contents of the line right there that's got the error. It's C equals AB. So if I had gone in MATLAB and was kept doing all this stuff, uh, it would have been uh, it would have been much simpler if I had just run this, noticed the error, figured it out while I had less lines of code, less to worry about. It's a much simpler matter. So yeah, that's that's the advantages. Uh, there are others. For example, in in this GUI, we have a couple different options for how to run the code. So if I go from left to right here, uh, the first option I have to run code or to execute the program right to have whatever programming we've written in here the lines of code uh have the computer run it the first option i have is run section if i do run section it does the exact same thing as run did however the difference is if i start to use sections whoops not using pound sign i want parentheses or uh percentage signs so if i have uh, percent, percent section one, and then percent percent section two, and then percent percent section three. Now, if I use this first option, if I want to disk uh, A now, if I want the first section to end with disk C, and I run it, it ends with disk C. Whereas if I click run here, it will end with displaying the value of A because it will just go through and do all of the sections. You have tools like section break, it will automatically add this percent percent. Um, you can run in advance. So that means immediately run this so that you can just go step by step and just click run in advance over and over till you get to the end. Or you can click run to end. and if I clear this, run to end, it does all the stuff. So effectively, this works a lot like this, run all sections. The difference is run to end, if you hold over it, says run from current section to end. So if I just did this, it would just run sections two and three uh, again. It wouldn't go back to section one, do it, then this, then section two, then section three, which really this is two. Now this is three and four, right? But nonetheless, uh, if I start at section three and click run to end, uh, this blue highlight just shows you, okay, you're in that section. So if I run to end, it will just do, it will just display one again. Um, so I've got a bunch of ones because I keep running just this one, the, these two sections. Um, whereas again, run does it from the top. There's also run in time. So if you click that, run in time, it will pop up this window that tells you, okay, this is how long running test two took. 0 0.001 seconds. So that's pretty fast, right? And again, that, this is why as engineers, we typically do not care that we're using a language that might be a little bit slower because 
this 0 0.001 seconds, we wouldn't notice if it was probably 0.1 second, maybe even one second we'd be fine with. So this 0 0.001 second, extremely fast, more than we really need. So yeah, that's another option here, run in time. Clear all, clear all breakpoints. So what are breakpoints? Uh, a breakpoint is if I click right here, uh, it will add a breakpoint right there. So if I hold over, pause execution at line four. So if I click run, it will run up to that point where I made a breakpoint. If I put another breakpoint there, um, it will run then again until there. So as you can see, if I press stop, uh, I had run to start with, right? So I click run. It now switches to continue, step, step in, step out, stop. So the main thing you're going to care about here is continue. So continue is going to just go from this breakpoint. It's going to first we ran that, and now we're running this, right? Um, and it doesn't do the point at which you're breaking. So it stops before that. If I if I do this again, run. It doesn't get to the C. It stops at right here. It stops before this line is executed. So you have continue. You can clear all. That will clear all the breakpoints. Uh, you can add some back. Um, you can also only put breakpoints where there's actually code. So this is a section. Uh, it's not where we're running. You're not the program doesn't do anything as a result of this other than allow you to run up to that point, right? Allow you to run in sections. So. So yeah, this is. Uh, this is an advantage of the GUI is that if if you're in the text editor, you can set breakpoints and you couldn't type that into here. You can't say like break add add break break point here. Right? If I if I type that in, MATLAB has no idea what I'm talking about. So I have to be in the editor and just I can click here. Uh, I can't click there because there's no code, but I can click on the next point of code and it'll break there. And one more real quick, just as we have the breakpoints right here, we can also do uh, just to the right of the number, which is just the number of the, the line we're on in the code. It'll just increase to show just ease of showing which, which line number you're on. So if I go up, if I click here to the right of that number, it's run to here. So run up to this line and pause. So basically it does a singular breakpoint, uh, but it doesn't need me to actually do breakpoints. I can just click continue to here and wherever I'm currently at in the program, it will run to that point. So yeah, those are the different options for running. Let's see what else. If I have, you don't need to know what this does exactly, but if I say well run, I say this one ends. Oh, sorry, well run, this one ends. This just keeps on going, right? It's just, you can see the flickering down here. It's just going and going and going. It doesn't care because effectively what I just said for it to do is while one or forever uh we'll explain that later but forever uh display one into the command window so it just displays it over and over and over and over it keeps printing it out so uh a very useful tool is control c if you're holding the control button and then you press c it will cancel whatever's going on in the command window right there so we were able to just close it, even though we uh, we didn't have a code that was ending. We were able to use Control C and stop it immediately. So it makes it very, it's a very useful tool. Otherwise, you're gonna have to, if you ever run into something like that, like that's looping or just taking too long, then you have to close it out, and it's just a big pain. Because uh, if I close it out, that will also stop the program but I don't want to have to do it. I want to just go back to the code and realize, okay, I typed in something that's going to run for way too long um, or forever. So I can use control C. And if you're ever seeing this online, if you're seeing like the instruction control plus C, that's what this, this means. Um, 
So you hold the control key and then you also press C and control is CTRL probably on your keyboard. Um, I recommend playing around with a few things, try and close these windows, pull them back up. And then the last thing I'm going to show you real quick is new live script instead of Instead of clicking new script, you do new live script. You can go back to the editor. That's just in the home tab of the toolbar. But uh, I click new script and I go here. Um, live scripts combine code output and formatted text in a single executable document. So what does that mean? If I go back and I do this right here, copy it, control C, control V to paste. I've got that in here right now, right? And if I run this, you can see it's a dot mix instead of dot m. And uh, this asterisk just means it's not saved yet. So if I control S or if I press save up here, I can go to, uh, this is the same spot. Uh, you can see if I, if I do dot m, it shows my two files right here, but I want, MATLAB live code MLX. I click save. Now when I run it, run. Now it outputs the result right here. If I did a times the, it will say ants equals one. So it will it will just go through line by line and show the output right here. So it allows you to Sometimes it's easier than dealing with doing your .m file, excuse me, and using the command window and then troubleshooting, doing a clear CLC, clear command window and having to run it again. Okay, that's not control plus C, where is that? Like, okay, it did that successfully, did that successfully, did that successfully. Unrecognized function control, click on the test two or click on the line 13, excuse me. If I can do it right, click on line 13, direct me to that. Okay. I didn't want that. So go back to run. If I had this in the live editor, now if I run it, it will run up all the, the way to there and then it will pop up unrecognized function or variable control. And it doesn't need to tell us the line number or anything. It's already there, right? So. I can just see, okay, unrecognized function or variable control. That's because I didn't want that in there. So these are, these are uh, pretty useful tools. You can do whatever's your preference for submitting the homework. You should submit it as a .m file. So if you do do .mlx live, live files, then just copy all your code. Uh, and put it back into a .m. But you're welcome to use this for troubleshooting or whatever. If you find that easier, you're welcome to do that. And then you can try out the different structures here. So in this case, it will just run line by line. It'll show the, the gray box here is outlining the code. And then you got the output here. So there are all sorts of fancy structuring. This is just the output. Uh, and then it's back to normal.